Excellent. We're back on to recording. So welcome again, everybody. Um, yes, this is I, I can't talk about cheese without paying homage to the great Ann Saxelby. Uh, she was an amazing human being, uh, an amazing cheesemonger, an amazing leader in the industry. And I do everything I can to help uh, uh, lift her name up uh, as it should live forever in American cheese. Absolutely. Um, wonderful. So today we're going to talk about customer service and as well as distribution. This is all part of, uh, of a domain of the customer service domain in uh, the CCP. But I'm also going to talk about cheesemonger tools. And at the end, I'm also going to be discussing uh, cheese dishes. I think I mis mistyped my email, um, cheese dished, but cheese dishes. And some of these, of course, are going to be asked on your test. Um, a couple of you have reached out to me asking for more materials and absolutely. So this weekend, I'm going to be sending out an email to all of you. I'm going to be sending out a list of European cheeses to know. Excuse me while I reach behind me. But everybody, I mentioned the book, The uh, Oxford Companion to Cheese. This is a giant book with many, many cheeses and a lot of information. I have compiled a shorter list of European cheeses to study uh, that can be on the test. And I'm going to send you that sheet so you can kind of help. Again, my job is to help lead you on where to study and help narrow down uh, the field of study. As well, I'm going to send you a quiz. I created, I've combined, I didn't write all the questions, but I combined, a, a, I want to say it's a little over 100 questions, uh, with the uh, questions and answers for you to kind of go on to and, and try at home on your own to give you a small idea of what the test will be like. They are not the questions from the test. So don't, don't think that, but it's just to give you a mindset of how to take a test and how to read it. So next class, we're going to review that quiz and we're going to review how to take the test. Um, and then I'm going to cover pathogens. So our next class will be reviewing the, the quiz and discussing pathogens. Wonderful. I'm going to keep, I'm going to roll right through it now. And again, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to ask or chat it in. All right. So the types of cheese service. So when going through the test and even reading and studying, there's going to be several different ways uh, of, that we can provide cheese out into the world. We're going to talk about distribution retail and wholesale, catering and restaurant. These are the biggest ways that, that cheese gets to the consumer. And talking about sales channel, and forgive me, like in a, I have added here uh, the bottom so you get to see where I, where I got this information from. So you know I'm not just pulling it from the air. But sales channels. Whether a cheesemaker is selling everything through a local's farmer's market, working exclusively with distributors, selling direct to retailers, or using a variety of sales channels, it's essential to understand that customers have individual requirements and needs. That statement in and of itself could be turned into a question. What are some, what are some of the ways that cheese gets to a consumer? And it could be local farmers markets, through a distributor, through retailers. <clears throat> A great start to building any customer relationship is to arrange a visit to the customer's warehouse, store, or restaurant, or to have a customer visit the creamery or facility. So here you see this wording is referring to if you were a cheesemaker. There's no cheesemakers on my call. So they, they're out there making cheese for us to sell, right, and to eat and enjoy. So some of this, I just want to again point out that you're not going to be asked questions as if you're a cheesemonger every time. You could be asked as if you are. And if you are a cheesemaker, it's important that you want people to come see you. And it's important that you want to go to where uh, you're selling your cheese. So I work with a distributor. So we have cheesemakers. They come check out our warehouse. They, they visit with the sales teams. They want to know that if they're doing business with us, that we know what we're doing in the cheese world and that we're going to take care of their product. And such exchanges allow the cheesemaker to meet the people. That's what I was saying, uh, to who will physically be handling and selling their cheese. That's one reason we, we here at GFI, like we support the CCP so much. And like we offer uh, the CCP exam to all of our employees and sales staff. 
We want all of our people to know how to take care of cheese um, and provide an opportunity to educate customers about both the cheese and the business and allow the producer and, and customer to taste products together. Just as importantly, these visits offer a chance for the customer to tour a facility and see firsthand effective SOPs, recall procedures, and HRPC plan that's are in place. So I'm going to keep driving it home. If you're making notes right now of what to look up and study, SOPs are going to be on your exam. Recall procedures are going to be in your exam. And the HARPC, all of those, if you look at the bottom right there, are found in the best practice guide for cheesemakers. So that's where you find that awesome information. So before engaging with or pitching products to any potential customer, a cheesemaker should have all of the following information available and in a presentable format so the customer can clearly understand it. There's at least two questions about this. Um, and they're going to ask, like, what is it, uh, you know, what, what information should be available for the customer? So the price of the product. So if you're a cheese maker and you're going to try to sell, you got to have the price. That just makes sense, right? How the product is going to get to the customer. Are you going to be shipping it direct through UPS? Small producers do that. Once you get to a certain size, you're going to want to get it delivered. You know, are you working, even working with a distributor? Are you selling it direct to a warehouse? Um, is the product getting picked up by a distributor? All of those things. You've got to know the cost of getting the product to the customer. You can't just show up with a, like what it, you know, whatever the cheese costs to make between your labor, between your um, uh, supplies and all that. You've got to be able to add shipping into it. It matters. Handling and storage tips. Every cheesemaker out there wants to know that their product is being taken care of. And this is a personal definition of cheesemonger for me. So this is not on the test, but it's our job as cheesemongers and retailers to ensure that the customer, the consumer is getting the cheese the way the cheesemaker intended it to taste. That, if you put that into your mind, that can kind of clear a lot of things up, okay? So just remember that. And they want to know how you're storing and handling tips. And that's also so triage. So Jasper Hill does a great job. I don't know if you've ever seen it because Harbison can sometimes come in with a little, you know, with mold around the spruce and maybe it's a little blue or green and that's okay. But they've created a one sheeter to tell people it's okay. This is what it's supposed to be. Uh, so all cheesemakers want to do that. The suggested shelf life. Uh, that's something that's important. How long is it supposed to be good for? And of course, we all know if we're in the cheese world that sometimes cheese uh, can last, can live well beyond uh, a sell-by date, or it could also perish even before it. But we still have to legally have that date tied into it. Milk source and farm location. So you need to know cow's milk, sheep milk, goat milk, what type of, what, what breed, where are the farms? This is more important because this helps us tell that story to the consumer and that's what helps sell artisan cheese. You don't have to have a story to sell craft or Velveeta. You don't need it. It's just junk. Uh, but these artisanal cheeses, we need to know that. Details of the cheese making operation and details of the maturing operation, how it's matured. Okay, continuing on with distribution and wholesale. The food distribution system in the U.S. is complex. It's a uh, that's uh, I, I know cheese and meat and, and I know how to sell. I know how to operate a retail business. But uh, I'm going to tell you, distribution is a, is a bit of a, a doozy. There's many players, including middlemen. Uh, from, we've got to produce, manufacture, transport, distribute, market, and sell every type of food product imaginable. By the time a product is placed on a grocery shelf, it's traveled countless miles and has been handled by many people. Each person has elevated and scrutinized the product to uh, assess its risk and opportunity. Each has considered quality, price, packaging, labeling, and market plans. Write that down. That is, that is, I remember that, something about that being on my exam in 2018. I'm gonna read that one more time. Uh, each has considered price, quality, packaging, labeling, and marketing plans. By the time the product is purchased, the manufacturer, broker, distributor, and retailer 
have all determined it to be viable and profitable. And the end consumer has deemed it to be of significant value. That's also important. So uh, the takeaway from this page are the last two um, bullet points. And I've got that. I gave uh, giving source credit. Uh, when I was researching this, this came from one of the website suggestions from the uh, ACS website. Okay, going now into sales channels here. So uh, economics of most distribution and wholesale companies are such that they're working with slim margins. Therefore, to keep overheads to a minimum and uh, to maximize profit, they usually rely on selling a high volume of products as efficiently as possible. I think there's at least one question about this, <laughs> just to let you know. Um, as far as understanding the, the, the process of, of distribution and wholesalers, uh, is that they've got to keep their, they've got to sell a lot of volume to make money because their overhead is low. Hopefully you've already got a sense of that in, in business. Uh, the nature of distribution and wholesale is that the cheese will need to successfully withstand the rigors of transportation from the creamery to the facility, to the warehousing and onward delivery to the customer. If that customer happens to be a retail store, then they will expect the product to arrive in good condition and have a reasonable shelf life upon arrival. That's fair. But again, that's a conversation that happens with uh, the, if you're a retailer, if you're starting a business, if you own a business, uh, if you're going to be selling cheese, you're going to want to create a relationship with the cheese maker. You may not get to speak to the actual cheese maker at all times, but their sales staff. You should be able to have that relationship where you can pick up a phone and call to make sure you get the pertinent information. And also if there's any issues with the cheese. And this is something to remember, not even just for a test, but if you do receive a piece of cheese that you feel is below quality, Make sure you, you follow the chain of command to make sure if you bought it from a distributor, hey, distributor, this cheese didn't come in the way I expected it to. Here's a photograph, the lot number and the date of this cheese. And the distributor that has that contact can follow back up with the cheesemaker because the cheesemaker will want to know. It's not going back and complaining, but it's rather making, again, ensuring that the product that we're selling to the end consumer is the way the cheesemaker intended it to taste. All righty. It's in everyone's best interest to provide as much support as possible to customers in the form of advice on product care and handling. Their success with the product becomes a cheesemaker's success. I myself answer questions all the time. I get uh, a CC'd on a lot of emails with uh, whether it's received in a larger retail format, smaller retail format, but is this cheese good? This cheese has mold on it. Is it bad? And it's always my goal as a, a cheese lover and expert to make sure that we're not number one, just trying to throw cheese away if it's a small detail, because again, cheese is a form of preserving the nutrients in milk. So cheese is, is meant to last a while and sometimes a, a spot of ambient mold can be on the outside and not at all affect the cheese. Whereas sometimes it can if that mold becomes certain colors or that cheese is too dried out. An increasing number of individuals working for retailers and distributors are becoming ACS certified professionals. If a business has an ACS CCP on staff, it can be taken as a positive indicator as these professionals will greatly appreciate and understand the unique qualities and handling requirements of specific cheeses. So you're like, Nathan, why are you putting that on there? That's Because that's on the exam. Again, if, if ACS says something about them and is doing what they can to lift up their voice, lift up their name, to lift up this accomplishment of passing this uh, certification, then you know there's going to be a question or two about the certification and the validity of it. And this is something to remember. So this is a good slide, even though it seems a little generic, but you know, it could be, what does it mean uh, to a business if they have a CCP on staff? And then it could be, well, it can be taken as a positive indicator <laughs> and it give you a couple other uh, selections. So that is absolutely gonna be asked. Okay, key considerations. Cheese makers should be aware that a wholesaler or distributor may ask that the cheese be prepared in a particular way. For instance, a bandage wrapped cheddar may need to have the bandages removed prior to shipping. 
Any additional cost incurred should be incorporated into that pricing of the cheese and communicated clearly to the customer. This is, this is a given. This is the way the business works. So whether you're going to be asking a question about it or just learning about the industry, um, you can, as a retailer, ask the cheesemaker for certain things. There are some retailers that, if they're large enough, could ask for a different size, could ask for a different pack size, a different style of cut. Um, but that's got to be communicated, of course, clearly worked out, whether in a contract uh, with, the, with the distributor or the cheesemaker to make sure they can do it. But of course, you have to expect more money. So you have to pay more because that's going to be extra labor involved. So some of these questions as they come up and some of this material that we're reading for the exam, you just need to understand the business aspect uh, of the cheese world. And hopefully you've been working again. That's why they require so many hours of working before you take the exam is that you should have some sort of base on this. If not, continue to read. And again, all of this is in the cheesemaker's guide. Uh, excuse me, the best practice for cheesemakers. A wholesaler or distributor is likely to expect a free sampling allowance. Cheesemakers should prepare for this and build a sampling allowance into the budget. I remember a question about this. Um, it means ultimately you could be, you know, a, a charge could be padded in uh, for the duration of you doing business with them, but it's okay to ask for a sampling allowance, especially if you're a new store or if you're an existing uh, retailer and you're bringing on a new product. It's with these artists and cheeses, you're going to have to sample it to customers to get them to purchase it. But it's okay to try to push back to the cheese maker to get free cheese to be able to do that. But ultimately, it's going to get built into the cost one way or another. So the word free <laughs> doesn't really exist in this situation. A retailer or distributor is like that. Oh, I read that. Sorry. If a cheese is seasonal or only available during certain times of the year, the cheese maker should make sure the distributor or wholesaler is aware, aware of this in advance. And that's going to happen. Love some seasonal cheeses. Um, you're going to see uh, a lot of them out there uh, and with, a, with the artists and cheese makers. Some of them only come along in the winter. Some only come around in the spring. And it's a bummer when we have a cheese that we love and it goes out of season and we have to wait several months for it to come back in. But that's the way it works. It's the same thing with like produce. You know, maybe we shouldn't have strawberries all year long. And that's why our tomatoes is a better example. I love tomatoes, but you know a tomato that comes out of a garden in July and August is going to be freaking amazing versus one that comes out of a hot house in December. You know, there, there's some foods that we expect as Americans to have all year long, but cheese, we need to get back to the roots and understand that, you know, the best of these products are going to be there for a little while. But it's up to the distributor or wholesaler to communicate that down to the retail level. And then, of course, at the retail level, we as cheesemongers have to describe that to the customer and deal with that and say, hey, this 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 Meadow Creek Grayson, it's only here for for several months out of the year. And this is our last batch. Go ahead and buy some and we'll let you know when it comes back into season next year. All righty. Sales channel. So retailers and restaurants. Uh, hopefully. So I did, of course, include and Sachs will be in the first uh, page and and hopefully here. A lot of you may recognize uh, the Antonellis. Uh, they are out of Texas. And of course, they hit the big time besides just being an amazing cheese shop and a great operation. But with the Capital One credit card commercial, they're, nas they're, they're nationwide right now. And so I'm going to take a sidebar and also point out that it's good to know uh, popular retailers in the American cheese world. They are living the dream. They're amazing. They're wonderful people. Uh, I haven't got to know them well, but we've chatted on a couple of meetings before, and they're de they're delightful. They're very passionate, and then they're then they're they're great leaders in our industry. So with that, it's good to know some of these places. Um, you may or may not get asked questions about it. I'm not 100 sure, but there are questions that deal back with some big time retailers. Um, you know, it may be good to know. You know, Murray's Cheese has been around for a while, and they have a lot of cheese shops across the country now. It's probably good to know that name. It's good to know the Antonelli name. Maybe know where they come from in Texas. I believe it's Austin. Just to have that basic information. And from that as well, the cheese authors. So please forgive me while I turn back and grab some more books. So uh, American Farmstead Cheeses, I think this is probably showing up backwards on your screen, but 
to know who Paul Kensett is. He wrote a couple of books. He's got, this is an amazing book. Uh, the, the American Chief Society really highlight this and, and ask that people read it. But he also wrote a book called Cultures in Cheese. He's an author to know. Um, any of these other books that uh, Mastering Cheese is a great book to know. So just to know the name, Max McKellen, he was one of the ones uh, who helped uh, begin the, the CCP exam and to help with the first exam. I would know those names. And just to have a, you don't have to study them and know their entire background, don't get me wrong, but to have a working knowledge that these people exist and what they did. Um, so perfect. I know I'm not trying to get too deep into that, but it is important to know some of these big names because in America, like the American Cheese Society, we want to promote our great American, not only cheeses, but the people who support great American uh, cheese makers. And besides that, another note, I would be aware of who won big awards as far as cheesemakers in the United States. Um, I think everybody should, here on this call should be aware that, you know, David Grimmels of Rogue Creamery had a cheese or still has a cheese that seasonal <laughs> Rogue River Blue that won uh, Best of Show, I believe it was in 21 at the World Cheese Awards. That's a big deal. So there's, there's a high likelihood that that could be asked because, again, that makes sure that everybody knows that and supports it. 2021, thank you. I, I try to remember everything if I don't have notes. But that's a big deal. Remember that. I would also remember one of my favorites as well. It's absolutely amazing. But know who has won the best of show in the American Cheese Society. So that is where you go back to the, the website. Um, cheesesociety.org and look through their website and they have a list of past winners. Like uh, an example, Pleasant Ridge Reserve. Pleasant Ridge Reserve has won best of show three times. There's a high likelihood you can ask about that. No, and, and again, you don't have to know who won everything in what category every single year. Focus on the big picture. The best of show winners, I would, I would kind of know those and be familiar with the names of those cheeses. Um, and that will, that'll help you out on the exam. It's not too much. Just read through it, uh, make a note about it. And I think you'll do fine with that. Okay. So thank you. That was a little sidebar, but an important one. Uh, again, know these important American authors, uh, and, and our big winners. Okay. Working directly with a retailer or restaurant, rather than using a distributor or wholesaler, gives cheesemaker an opportunity to communicate closely with the buyer and obtain valuable feedback about those cheeses. You know, that's what I mentioned earlier, is cheesemakers want to be involved. But if you can imagine, like, if you've got, I'm going to mention Pat Ford from Beehive. Freaking love Pat Ford. He's an amazing individual, kind, nice, passionate, and he wants to be able to communicate to everybody. But just think about this. He, as nice as he is and as wonderful as he is, it's going to be hard for him to communicate to every single body that, that, that sells his cheese. He's going to do his best to do so because he's great. But that's also part of the job of the distributor or wholesaler. That's where, like, that's why, you know, say we at GFI, we would want to be able to help manage that communication so that Pat doesn't have to talk to a thousand people a day, but we could help filter in information. Um, and as with any customer, the retailer or restaurant should be asked what their needs and expectations are. For example, they may be seeking a particular flavor profile or age of cheese. This just goes into also when you're picking out whether you're a restaurant um, or a retailer. Let's put our let's put our retailer restaurant hats on and we're purchasing cheese from somebody. We're going to need a little assistance if we're doing that. Like let's say we're setting up a cheese board at a restaurant. We want to be able to talk to somebody that has enough wear for all and knows cheese well enough to help pick out the flavor, flavor profiles, give advice on different textures, on different milk types, to be able to help to build that together. So this whole slide here is really about the communication that's needed to help people succeed. All right. And now sales, continuing on with sales channels. So some customers are looking for a cheese made exclusively for them in a different format or size than the normal production. I mentioned that earlier. Um, this happens a lot, of course, with your, your large retailers. You can do that. Um, and you'll see a lot of like special washes. Jasper Hill does is great with this. 
they'll do something with Whole Foods or something with Murray's or even other chains. You don't have to be that big. They're willing to do that. But the thing is, you've got to buy that product. If you're a retailer, if you're a consumer and you're going to put it on a cheese maker to create a special wash, to do a special cut, to do something that's unique for you from them, then you're going to need to make that commitment to purchase that product and you're going to, and like, you're going to own it. I don't want to say ne- it's not negatively you're stuck with it, but you're going to have to own that product, right? And if this is the case, there should be written confirmation from the retailer or restaurant detailing the nature of the contract because again with that, it's got to be money. See, you get what I'm saying. Will it be maple wash? It's amazing. You're going to get these wonderful things because these retailers, all these places, they want something unique. Uh, But if you do that, again, that's a contract. That means, and oftentimes, you're going to get what's called exclusivity, where, you know, I've worked with different companies before. I remember I was working with a a company and we, we, we were the first to talk to Sartori about bourbon washing cheese. I remember being in that conversation. But with that came... You know, we got an exclusive for one year. For one year, nobody else in the country could sell that cheese. And we had to purchase all of that cheese that they produced. We had to ask for a certain amount and it was on us to pay for it and sell it once we got it. So they could, so they're not stuck with anything. But after that year is up, after that exclusivity and that contract, that product got to be a little well known and they rolled it out to everybody in the country. And that's what happens. And that's what's successful for cheesemakers. And that's that's a good thing for them. The retailer got to have something exclusive for a while, but then the cheesemaker got a new cheese to put out there and boom, it blossomed and went across the country. Uh, but again, it was in a contract and specifying minimum quantities of the exclusive cheese and how long this commitment will remain in place. I just used, a, I, I pulled a year out of my head. That, that's, that's, that's common in the cheese world, like one year exclusivity. But if you have a contract, you can write it out, whatever you want, as long as both parties agree to it. Uh, This may seem a little convoluted, but again, there's at least one question on the exam having to do with this. So hopefully I'm I'm making my point. And it's worthwhile for a cheesemaker to actively seek feedback about the products being sold from the retailer or restaurant. They want to know, guys. Like this is a this is something where they, you know, as a cheesemonger, I used to think I was hounding people. You know, even when I was buying cheese at, uh, at, at my lower level, I was like, well, this cheese came in like that. They, they want to know because cheesemakers want to know, like, is the distributor taking care of my cheese? Is there something wrong with my batch? You know, things like that could happen. There could be a different strand of mold growing in their caves that's causing a yellow mold instead of a white mold. They want to know. They want to be able to make their product right. And of course, they don't want to make anybody sick. Um So this allows for an unbiased feedback and market research at no charge to the cheesemaker. That's that's key, is the feedback we give as people who buy cheese, whether we're retailers, restaurants, wholesalers, distributors. When we talk to that cheesemaker, we're giving them free feedback. They're already stretched pretty thin. You know, like like artists and cheesemakers, they're not walking around in tuxedos all day long. That's not, that's not how they operate. They're working hard for every bit of money that they get. And they and like for them to have to pay for like marketing research and get an outside company in to do research, that's a lot of money. They could get it free. We could help them just by simply giving feedback. Um, and this may uh, and supply information that can assist in refining and improving the cheese recipe and maturation process. I've given feedback about, excuse me, cheese getting like too bitter sometimes. But that's it's also important for us to taste cheese all the time. I'm a big proponent. If you work in a shop, if you're opening up a wheel, like even if you've tasted Pleasant Ridge before and you know it, taste it again because you love it. The more you taste cheese, the more you're going to be able to really pick up those nuances and know what it tastes like. So if something's off, you can be like, this is weird. This has this has a bitter consistency to it that it normally doesn't. If you give that feedback, that cheesemaker can correct that problem. <clears throat> so, Individual retailers and restaurants are likely to want to buy cheese in smaller quantities. So individual retailers, so independents. Let's let's now we're putting on our independent retailer hat uh, and restaurants. They're not going to want to buy as much. They can't buy a pallet. They can't buy a a container, so to speak. Uh, So a cheesemaker should be prepared to split cases if necessary or to sell pre-cut cheeses from large format cheeses. This is something we saw a lot in COVID times which I guess we're still all suffering from that. But 
you know, again, I'm going to use Jasper Hill as an example, just because I, I remember this conversation and going on is, you know, at that time, cheese sales got down a little bit for a while and people really couldn't buy, a, say, a whole wheel of Cabot cloth bound, which is delicious. A big retailer can. A smaller shop, even though you get a quarter, sometimes it's harder to sell. So they're, they were asking for pre-packs um, and they did that. And so some cheesemakers could go in, create specific pre-packs knowing that ultimately the best way to sell cheese is from the larger format. But if you don't do generate enough business, if you don't have enough foot traffic, then it may be more beneficial to have those pre-packs. A retailer, especially one with multiple outlets, such as a grocery store chain, may request a free sampling allowance. Set that twice. That's coming up twice. A cheesemaker should be prepared for this, knowing in advance which cheeses are to be sampled and promoted. And also, too, the cheesemakers are going to create POS materials and hand out and this is a personal note, they spend a lot of money on that. If you don't use their POS materials, tell them. Just to be like, I appreciate that you create POS materials. We don't have place for them on our counter. So like, don't waste all of that on us. But if you do, and you do have space, support those cheesemakers by handing out some of that POS material. It's up to us to work together. We're a family. No matter what company you work for, no matter if you're a retailer, distributor, like retail, uh, wholesaler, whatever. We're all here to support our cheesemakers. Let, 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 let's support them. If a cheese is seasonal or available only during a certain time of year, the cheesemaker, should they make that aware? We already talked about that. Okay, so that was a lot of the business side. Uh, please know that, you know, you're not going to get asked a ton of questions about that. But from just those slides I introduced, uh, I would say you're going to get probably eight at least uh, coming from all of those slides we just talked about. So it is important. Now I'm going to talk to you about B Corp certified. This is, is this, now they're not going to ask specifically what it takes to be a B Corp, not to my knowledge, but I'm going to go through this because this is becoming more uh, uh, widely known, more widely appreciated, and more cheese makers and more people in the food industry are becoming more driven to do this. Point of sale, that's right, point of sale POS materials. So B Corp certification is a designation that a business is meeting high standards of verified performance, accountability, and transparency on factors from employee benefits and charitable giving to supply chain practices and input materials. In order to achieve certification, a company must do the following. You got to demonstrate high social and environmental uh, performance by achieving a B impact assessment score of 80 or above and passing our risk review. Multinational corporations must also meet baseline requirement standards. You gotta make a legal commitment by changing their corporate governance structure to be accountable to all stakeholders, not just shareholders and achieve benefit uh, corporation status if available in their jurisdiction. You gotta also Exhibit transparency by allowing information about their performance uh, measured against B-Lab standards uh, to be publicly available on their B-Corp profile. Let's don't get too washed down in that. Now you have an understanding. It means that you support the environment. You support your community. You're taking steps to make sure that your business, like in the simplest terms, your business is not a drag on the environment, your community, or your employees. It's time to start paying back. Um, but what you could be asked, more likely, you're going to be asked about what cheese producers are B Corp certified. The ones I know of currently, and I've continued to do research, Vermont Creamery, Cabot Creamery, Road Creamery, and Tillamook. That would be my big takeaway from this slide. Is you, I remember one question specifically about B Corp. And it was more about they gave A, B, and C, D, like the list they gave. They could have said Vermont Creamery, Cabot Creamery, uh, Uplands. So they would throw one in that's not a B Corp. Know these four. If you know these four, that would probably be one of the answers to a question. Excellent. Okay, so customer service. Now, I am, I've never worked with Zingermans. I am not a certified Zingerman trainer, so I'm not taking any credit for this. I've just pulled some information out because there was a question about Zingerman customer service on the test that I took in 2018. It may have gone away. I don't know. But also, I would know Zingerman's 
as a business, as a as a cheese shop in the United States from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, know the the owner Ari. Uh, he has and they have a beautiful training program. Whether it's leadership, customer service, they've done a great deal. So again, I'm pushing all the credit to them. I am just repeating something that they've said. But I do want to cover this because it's important. <clears throat> Why bother giving great service? Uh, great service makes a business something special. We need customers uh, far more than they need us. Great service is sound marketing. The best advertising is done by word of mouth. Um, giving great service keeps your customers coming back. Uh, customers that get great quality products but poor service are less likely to give your shop a second shot. That's just also good to know in business. I'm going to repeat that. Customers who get great quality products, yum, yum, delicious products, but you get crummy service, they're less likely to give your, 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 your shop a second shot. And in contrast, a high number of customers who received great service, uh, but like received substandard products, they're still going to return. People want good customer service. And I know we're getting into a world of virtual, uh, not virtual, but like, you know, being able to order online, getting delivery. A lot of people don't want to talk to people anymore, but human beings, ultimately, we're social creatures. We want to be able to talk. And especially now that people since COVID times have been like going to TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and learning more about food, people are more interested in food and what they eat, where it comes from, and they want to be able to have a conversation about it. I feel like we're gonna we're on a cusp of a new customer service uh, uh, resurgence um, for those who still want to shop. And I'm a person who trains cheesemongers that, that work in customer service, so I'm gonna push for it. Great service yields for better bottom line results. Service effectiveness can directly increase sales. It brings repeat business, cuts down on errors and waste, and it builds customer loyalty and reduces time a manager is gonna have to deal with problems. Uh, yeah, the more times you have to deal with problems, the less you're able to get, get your work done. Um, it makes for a better place to work. If you raise your service standards in your organization, you're almost guaranteed to have a more enjoyable place to work. Uh, when you and your staff are focused on being courteous and going the extra mile for your customers, then that spirit cannot help but to spill over into how you treat uh, and work with others. Uh, and the way we treat, the way, excuse me, the way people treat their peers is really one of the biggest uh, contributors to quality of workplace. I, I agree with all of this. This is amazing information. And the thing is, if you go into work and you're going to try to have fun and leave whatever worries and trials and tribulations you have in your personal life behind you at the front door, then you're going to have a more enjoyable place to work. And we all have to work. I mean, there's not enough lottery drawings out there for all of us. I wish there was, but we got to work. We got to have a good time. And there's always going to be those people that we work with that kind of drag us down. And that makes work less fun. As cheesemongers, if we support each other and work on great customer service, if we treat other people well, we're going to treat our workmates well. That's what it's saying. And great service helps you attract better people to your work and your organization. As it becomes increasingly difficult to hire a number of people who get to work uh, that their needs be done, the most enjoyable workplace might just be what we need to attract the best employees out there. I think like going through, I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of companies across the country, you know, we're in a situation where employees are interviewing employers right now, not formally, but, you know, between like the glass door app, you know, like people are, are judging businesses and people want to know before, before somebody goes and works in another business, they're going to look up and say, well, how do they treat their people? You know, how do they, how many days off do they get? And that's why some companies are having a hard time finding employees because they're not an enjoyable place to work and people are finding that out. So if you're an employer, you've got to make your place wonderful so that you can attract great people. Positive work, uh, the positive nature of our work environment gives us a significant edge. Good people want to work in a good place. I always give the personal example that when I, uh, when I was working the counter in New York City at Murray's, I was having fun. At least once a week, a customer would ask me for an application because they thought this place was so fun. They wanted to work there. And we hired a couple of people from that. And that's, that is real. That's a valid thing that actually happened to me. I love <laughs> selling cheese to people. I think it's fun. And if you can carry that through, you can get those good people to work. And the more we give great service, the likely we are to attract better staff. All right. Other than that, 
uh, uh, great, giving great service is just easier. It may not seem so, but it's easier uh, to do things right than to have to go back and fix them later. And it takes a great deal of effort to try to get customers back after they've received bad service. It's just the right thing to do. When people are giving great service to our guests, we're making some sort of small positive contribution to their lives. I'm a cheesy guy that believes that. I've seen somebody come in my store before having a bad day. If you're in customer service, you should be able to read people's um, body language and facial expressions. And somebody that's just had a rotten day, sometimes just by looking at them in the eye and smiling, saying, how are you doing today? I'd love to offer you a sample of my favorite cheese. You could brighten up their day. Um, you could brighten up their day. Is, is this guide in the B, BPG or in the BOK library? Uh, I don't know those acronyms. I apologize. Uh, I can, I'm happy to send this out. Uh, the Zingerman's Guide for Giving Great Service was given as a uh, resource to study for this exam. So if that answers your question, I ordered the book online. Uh, Ari also has all this. Actually, I, I would listen to it on Audible. I'm a big Audible person. I love to listen to things when I'm traveling. So that's where I found this. But 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 Zingerman's Guide to Great Giving Great Service was on the list of, of possible. Best practice guide. No, no, no. This is not in there. Great question. This is separate. Perfect. I got this directly from their customer service guide. Wonderful. Keep them coming. Um, so it's always, it's just the right thing to do. We want to keep them smiling, keep them coming back. Wrapping this up with some facts that they gave, only 14% of customers who switch service providers do it because they were unhappy with the product. Most make the move because they were dissatisfied with the customer service they received. Now, we all know that we're also dealing in the era of Karens. Pardon my English. I hope anybody, if you're named Karen, I apologize. But we all know that this is going on. But we always know that we're going to give the best customer service to those who need it. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to be great. Nearly three quarters of all customer purchases are made by repeat purchasers. The cost of gaining a new customer is nearly five times that of keeping an existing client. That could be on the exam. The best service providers keep their customers nearly 50% longer. So this is when our, they were quoting another book. This came from a book called Emotional Value, Creating Strong Bonds with Your Customers, uh, written by Barlow and Maul. All righty, customer service techniques. Just moving on past that. Proactive selling. So there's proactive selling, active sampling, and passive sampling. I just want to go over these definitions. Proactively selling cheese means that you do not wait for a customer to ask questions. Rather, you are to take the initiative and actively hand them a sample and sell them a cheese based on the conversation you start with them. So if you're a cheesemonger and you're working at a cheese counter, it's your job. That's what you're there for is to say, if it's old Amsterdam that you're handing out, I've got this great Gouda uh, called old Amsterdam. This is a raw cow's milk. I don't know if it's raw or pasteurized off my head, but you give the information, start it and hand a sample. That's proactively selling. Active sampling ties in with proactive selling, where you ensure that every, everyone that comes up to the cheese shop receives a piece of cheese, while you inform them of the milk type, where it's made, what it pairs well with, and the story of the cheese and the cheesemaker. That's also good information if you were to design a cheese sign. That was also something that I remember being on the exam is, you know, what would be pertinent information to put on a sign, a cheese sign, if you're operating a shop. And I would say milk type, where it's made, what it pairs well with, the story of the cheese and the cheesemaker, right? Passive sampling is where you leave out pre-made samples of cheese with or without a pairing and leave a card with written information on a cheese left for sampling. Kind of like what we see here. I'm not knocking old Amsterdam. This is just a picture I found. But one thing about that, if you leave cheese uncovered, this is not on the exam, but this is for you to know if you sell cheese. If you have flies going around your shop or flies exist, just know that every time a fly lands, it poops. So if you leave cheese samples out and you got flies, you're handing out, you're giving people samples of fly poop. If you're going to do passive sampling, do it well. Keep it covered. Uh, we want to give people uh, samples of cheese, but make sure we're staying clean and taking care of our customers. All righty. Cheese boards and choices. Now, this is where it gets a little nebulous. So if you get asked pairing questions on the exam, you're going to have to choose the best answer, okay? So here are some tips 
to help you come up with those best answers. Because it's a little nebulous, you may not get a, a ton of questions about pairings. You will get asked about some traditional ones, and I'm going to cover that in another slide. But cheese board, when building a cheese board, most cheese experts recommend three to five cheeses per cheese board. Offer your customer different textures, flavor profiles, and milk types. Start with a safe cheese, one with a less intense flavor profile, then work your way up from there. I like to start when, when talking about basic, like start like a, like a basic Havarti. That's an easy going, like make sure you start with a cheese that everybody's probably going to like, and you can get more complex after that. Offer samples to help your customer decide what they like. That's always a big one. Offer samples. Uh, with experience, you're going to learn how to have a cheese board suggestions already memorized for your customers with different tastes and budgets. So condiments. A cheese board is just a plate of cheese if you've got no pairing item. A pairing item is some form of condiment, um, some form of condiment that when put with a particular cheese creates a new taste and texture profile with each bite. On your cheese board, try to include the following. Sweet, savory, acidic, crunchy, umami, nutty, fruity. There's a lot of ways you can go with it for here. Now, visual appeal. Cheese boards are just, are much more than just a yummy plate of cheese and condiments. They're also considered by many an edible work of art. If you're on Instagram and you follow anybody in cheese, you know that people, people show out when they're putting their cheese boards together, right? Like that's the biggest, biggest thing going on right now. Everybody loves to make it pretty. Sometimes they'll put flowers, uh, all kind of stuff, a bunch of herbs all over it. And everybody's got their own rhyme or reason why they do it. Me, myself, as a cheese person, I'm all about taste, texture. I want things to go well when you put them on your palate. I want them to look visually good, but I'm the type of person too that if it's something that somebody's not going to put in their mouth, then why put it on a cheese board? But I'm maybe I'm not a frou frou guy, you know. Like I think that's why I like the picture of this cheese board. This is all edible. Everybody's going to be able to. Everybody's going to be able to get it right. Uh, but include the following. This is more more factual. Include the following to make your cheese board a true masterpiece: bright fresh fruit, colorful olives candied and roasted nuts, jam spreads and marmalades, and charcuterie. Okay, so here's more about the exam. These are more of your factual things that you're going to get asked about. So traditional cheese pairings from around the world. So again, pairings can be nebulous. They're, they're, it's, it's, it's personal. Whatever you think tastes good, think is a good pairing. Whatever you like is a good pairing, generally. But what you'll see traditionally and what is what happens a lot, Stilton and Port. Stilton and Port is a solid pairing. It happens a lot of time around the holidays. I remember selling this, being around English people particularly. They're going to have that. That's a, that's a tradition. Longra and Champagne. So I would, if you're not familiar with Longra, I would know that cheese um, and know that, you know, it's made with a little dimple inside and people just like the background of this picture, if you can see it, people like to pour champagne into that dimple and slice it. That's traditional. Cheddar and apples is generally traditional. Now, pulling that together, again, like it's, it's to your taste, but what they could ask you as far as a pairing question on the exam, is it to be more seasonal? You know, so they may ask, of what is a beautiful fall pairing with apples? I mean, excuse me, a fall pairing with cheddar. And we would need to know that, well, apples are a fall fruit. So it may be like they could say uh, cheddar and tomatoes. Probably not that, but I'm trying to throw out an example of something that doesn't uh, ripen in, in the fall, something that may come out in the spring or winter. Uh, but cheddar and apples are generally considered uh, traditional. Roquefort and Riesling is traditional. Brie and champagne. Brie and champagne, you see champagne used a couple of times, but, but brie comes from the champagne region in, in, in France. So some of these may not be a seasonal thing, but it could be what we call what grows together, goes together. And this is where you would have to know about regional foods. Um, and then uh, sharp cheddar, rustic red over warm apple pie, you bet your bottom dollar. That sounds delicious. And then Raclette with potatoes. These are some simple ones, 
but these these are kind of been written about in books several times. So this isn't just like, oh, this is what Nathan finds good. This is what is is constantly written about and generally perceived as traditional pairings, okay? Other things you'll need to know for the exam, and hopefully you've already got all this down. Uh, but again, some of you may not be cheesemongers. This is, if you're a cheesemonger, you know these. If you may be a sales rep, you may not. So know your parm tools. So tools every cheesemonger should know. Parm knives. You know you have a scoring knife. You're not going to get shown a picture. Just, just to let you know, they don't show images and say, name this. There's Everything is written sentences. Uh, but they could ask, like, what are the four names for parm uh, general parm tools? Scoring knife, which is used to cut the rind, a cleft knife, which is sharp, which you dive into the rind, an almond knife, which you take to the edge, and then, of course, a raclette knife. I still got to look up why parm knives are called raclette knives, so you can even use it for raclette. But those are your four tools to open up a wheel of a Reggiano or Grana Padana. You can also use a scoring knife for hard goudas, things like that. You're also going to have a double handle wire. Sometimes I remember it being called a piano wire back in my early days of cheesemongery. Uh, and it's just because it's a it's like a 24 inches, two to three feet long, the handle on each end. And you use that for opening large format wheels, such as Comte, I mean Gruyere. Uh, you've seen them used for large format cheddars. They're they're very typical in the cheese world. Two that I recall being on my exam, wink, hint, hint. Skeleton knife. A skeleton knife is used for cutting soft ripened cheese. And if you look at that blade, the reason for it, like they have those holes in it. So that's why they call it a skeleton because it's just, it's got those gaps in there and it's for, it, it's made that way. So you'd have less surface area for, for gooey cheeses to stick to. Because I don't know if you've ever had, like if you try to use like a big wide uh, blade chef knife to go into something gooey, you're, a lot of that cheese is just gonna stick to the blade and you're gonna waste some product. So skeleton knife, I'd remember that. And at the bottom, uh, our beautiful cheese, and one you should know, tete de moi, which translates generally into the head of the monk, uh, raw cow's milk cheese out of Switzerland. You use a Girol machine for creating cheese flowers. Um, some people also call it a cheese curler, but the word Girol, they're pronouncing it the best of my ability, uh, that is one to know for your exam. That is, they, they may have taken it off recently, but I remember that those two being asked about specifically. Also, you're going to have a platform cheese cutter. You should know that. A Roquefort bow. People in my day used to call it a harp and a wire, but a Roquefort bow is to cut soft ripened cheeses as well as blues because you have that wire and you've got it and, it and it stays really taut and firm within that harp. And you're able to, and I, I use this example because I can pick up a piece of cheese and just press down with it and you get a nice smooth cut. And then of course your double handled cheese knife, which is used to like goudas and really hard cheeses and even like memolette. Excellent. Cutting boards. Um, cutting boards are an essential part of any cutting station. Boards should be cleaned and sanitized regularly. It's recommended that boards are clean and sanitized when switching between cheeses, as well as different batches of cheese. Boards should always be in good condition. If a board is showing excess signs of wear and tear, such as rough surfaces or deep score marks, and that's hard to clean, then you need to replace it. That's just common sense, but we have to push this out because we want to make sure that we have no cross-contamination damaging our cheese. To stop a cutting board from sliding around stainless steel, you can put a, 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 a towel underneath it to keep it from sliding. One big thing to know, I need to add to this slide. Uh, you, I remember this being on my exam, a question about what's the proper way of cleaning a cutting board in a cheese shop? So you'll need to know that you, of course, you've got to uh, rinse it, wash it, sanitize it, and let it air dry. Those are steps you need to remember for the exam. All righty. So I've got this class scheduled until uh, I've got two minutes left. I'm going to keep going. I've got probably 10 to 15 more minutes to talk, and I'm going to make sure this stays recorded and I'll be able to post it. So if you have to leave, I understand. Thank you for coming. If you have time to stay for 15 more minutes, I'm going to go over some of these recipes for the exam. And just I'm just going to keep rolling. If you got to go, 
I'll see you next time. And just know that I'm going to start sending out a better forecast of these classes so you can plan your life a little bit more in advance. Don't worry, I'm working hard on that. Cheese recipes to know for the exam. Rocklet. Rocklet, of course, is a cheese, but rocklet is also like a dish at the same time. Rocklet comes from the French word meaning to scrape uh, and refers to both the types of cheese of traditional Swiss and French. Um, so cheese legend has it that the dish originated hundreds of years ago when farmers or shepherds uh, would heat up a piece uh, of cheese. I love raclette too. Like raclette is one of these cheeses that tastes completely different once you melt it. Uh, but farmers would heat up a piece of cheese over an open fire uh, for a hearty meal, a hearty filling meal. I've also heard that you would put it on like a, they would heat up a rock in the fire pull that rock out and then put the cheese on top of it to let it melt. And they'd have to scrape the cheese off the rock. And that, that's one reason too. Popular since the middle ages, raclette is still produced with milk from cows that are fed fresh grass in the summer and meadow hay in the winter, resulting in an aromatic cheese ranging in flavor from mild and milky to piquant, uh, strong, depending on the wheel. Typically it's melted either in a raclette grill as pictured uh, or using professional melter and then pour it to scrape on uh, each individual dish. Raclette is particularly delicious, roasted over potatoes. Remember, I mentioned that before. Uh, it, it goes, it's traditional over potatoes because it's also an inexpensive meal. Farmers and shepherds going around, potatoes, you could last for a while. You know, you could, you could haul some potatoes around, get a pot of water from the creek, boil them up a little bit, and then pour cheese on them. And you've got a healthy meal that's going to sustain you throughout the night and help you work the next day. But it also goes well with uh, root vegetables, pickles, and cured meats such as prosciutto, and even bresola. Raclette's amazing. If you haven't tried it, do it. Allergol. Uh, so this is one that was new to me, quite honestly. I, uh, I needed to broaden my horizon in the food world. But uh, allergol is a rich potato cheese dish, somewhat like fondue in texture and taste, which is usually served alongside sausages and other types of meat. And just know I'm getting all of these recipes were listed out on the body of knowledge. That's why I'm talking about them. I just didn't pull these from the air. All of this was mentioned in your body of knowledge. It's associated uh, with, the central, uh, with South Central France and is believed to have been created by local monks. It's prepared by cooking boiled mashed potatoes with cheese, creme fraiche, butter, and seasonings. All of my favorite things. I'm like, oh my God, my mouth is watering right now. Uh, while adaptations of this dish call for various cheeses, Allergol, uh persists, uh, purists, excuse me, argue that only the family of French cheeses known as Tom is acceptable. French are very particular. They have a right to be. Uh, and traditionally made with uh, Tom de Legault or Tom de Verne cheese, Allergol is a French country uh, specialty, highly appreciated in the local gastron gastronomy uh, with sausages and roast pork. Other cheeses are also available, Pontal, mozzarella. So this is, and here in America, we'd probably put anything in there. Uh, but the choice of cheese is important and strongly affects the result. All righty, Welsh rarebit or fancy grilled cheese. <laughs> Welsh rarebit, uh, also called Welsh rabbit, is a traditional British dish consisting of toasted bread topped with savory cheddar cheese sauce that it typically includes such ingredients as beer or ale, Worcestershire sauce, cayenne, mustard, and paprika. If you've never made Welsh rarebit, oh my God, like look up a recipe. It's just a lot of fun and really delicious. It's, 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 it's rich and wonderful. Um, if an egg is served on top, uh, it's called buck rarebit. That's not on the exam. That's just a little extra. The origins of the name are uncertain. The earliest cited use of the term Welsh rabbit uh, was in 1725 with the alternate form rarebit, uh, a word that has no meaning aside from the dish appearing in 1785. You know, people like to make up words. Uh, popular legend suggests that the meat-based name for this meatless dish stems from the Welsh peasants for whom cheese was a substitute for the meat that they could not afford. Whatever its origins, the dish is today a staple of British fare and common pub food, often paired with a pint or, or nice ale. I think I have Welsh heritage, so I absolutely love this. All right, uh, tartiflette. 
Um, and again, I'm working, my pronunciations may be a smidge off and I apologize for that, but tartiflette uh, is a, a dish from Savoy in the French Alps uh, from the Osta uh, Valley and is made with potatoes, Roblechon cheese. Roblechon is amazing. And I'd probably write that down to know what Roblechon is. You cook Roblechon with lardon and onions and a splash of white wine can be added to the word tartiflette is probably derived from the uh, word potato uh, or from the uh, uh, tartiflettes, a term found uh, in the Pro Provencal, it's kind of Italian. Uh, this modern recipe was inspired by a traditional dish. Uh, it's kind of like potatoes au gratin made with, uh, think of potato au gratin almost with, with Roblechon and it is absolutely amazing. All righty. Uh, consulé uh, is made from cow's milk in uh, French Comté. Uh, it's also produced uh, in Luxembourg and called, I'm going to mess this up, cachis or cooked cheese. Uh, it's usually melted over a small flame with water or milk uh, before the addition of salt and butter. The cheese is sold in containers. So this is something normally you're going to buy in a pack. Um, it's just to kind of really know that this exists. It's best eaten hot or cold, and it's delicious on bread or vegetables. Poutine. Oh, God, you're talking a fat boy's dream here. I love some poutine. Uh, it's an amazing cheese dish composed of fries, tops with cheese curds, and hot gravy. Um, though it's not officially Canada's national food, it's actually the subject of uh, some contention, as well as it should be. You can't, right? I'm going to hear this. New Jersey calls it disco fries. There you go. There's always a version of this. And it is, I mean, it's, you don't need to eat it every meal. <laughs> it's not particularly healthy, but it is delightful, right? <coughs> uh, but of course, the main thing to know is it's fries uh, with, with, with cheese curds and, and, and gravy, and it's tied to Canada. And it's absolutely amazing. Then of course, fondue. Fondue is huge. I remember definitely a question about fondue being on the exam. Uh, before it was declared the country's national dish in 1930, fondue was a recipe used out of necessity by peasants in the Swiss Alps. We all, like everywhere in the world, has a peasant dish where we throw things that are left over together in a pot, like goulash. You know, um, trying to think of some more things that have to do with like, like barbecue. Uh, there, there's all, like mostly soups and stews come out of this, and it's just, and they end up being very delightful, right? Uh, herders in the Alpine locals often relied on leftover cheese and stale bread to get them through months of cold, harsh weather uh, when, produce, when, when, when produce was inaccessible. In its most basic firm, the term fondue consists of a pot of bubbly melted cheese, often soaked up by pieces of cubed bread, fruits, veggies, meats. Again, you can dip whatever your favorite thing is. Um, though you often find Emmental, or what is properly recognized as Swiss cheese in a melting pot. Generally, Gruyere is melted for fondue. Um, I've always heard, like when I worked in, in, in on the counter a lot, people would often buy Emmentaler, Appenzeller, and Gruyere. You can mix up anything. You could have it with just Gruyere if you wanted to. You know, there's not a law about it, but just know that it is melted cheese, right? Mixed with white wine or water, garlic and spices, and it's absolutely amazing. Okay, onion soup. Uh, this is another big one that has to do with cheese. Onion soups have been popular for uh, at least dating back from Roman times. Again, onions are cheap. You get, you get water is cheap. You get water and onions, you cook it up, add a couple of seasonings and to make it more healthy, to get more nutrients out of it, you pop some cheese on top, right? The modern version of this soup originates in Paris, France in the 18th century, made from beef broth and caramelized onions. Oh gosh, I love some of French onion soup. Uh, and it was introduced to the United States uh, by the New York restaurant of uh, Henri Marquin in 1861, where his wife Marie uh, was the chef. And it's often uh, finished by being placed under a salamander, which is basically like you're broiling it. It's a broiler uh, and a ramekin where you put a piece of toast and some conté on top. You can also use Gruyere. Uh, frittata. Everybody hopefully has had a frittata. Uh, crustless quiche is what I lovingly refer to it as. Uh, Egg-based Italian dish, similar to an omelet. Uh, crustless quiche or scrambled eggs enriched with any vegetables that you want to it. All righty, mac and cheese. I think we're all familiar with it. This is kind of like fondue. 
this started and this and it took off and everybody's got their own rendition of it. Uh, but know that a recipe called macaroni and cheese appeared in 1824 cookbook, The Virginia Housewife, written by Mary Rudolph. Rudolph's recipe had three ingredients, macaroni, cheese, and butter. Oh, layered together and baked in a hot oven. That just sounds amazing, right? Uh, similar recipes for macaroni and cheese occur in the 1852 Handbook of Useful Arts. By the mid-1880s, cookbooks as far west as Kansas, uh, Missouri uh, included recipes for macaroni and cheese casseroles, and really it took off. Uh, factory production of the main ingredients made the dish affordable. Uh, and recipes made it accessible, but not notably popular. As it became accessible to a broader section of society, macaroni and cheese lost its upper class appeal and now considered a comfort food. And that probably came along the time more so when, when Velveeta came about, because dry pasta and Velveeta, you could melt it, you know, you could cook that, put it together, and that's technically macaroni and cheese, and anybody could eat it, right? And then, of course, grilled cheese sandwiches. I know this sounds basic, uh, but there's a little history to it. During World War II, Navy cooks prepared countless American cheese-filled sandwiches uh, as instructed by government-issued cookbooks in ships' kitchens. So time of World War II, again, that's the high rise of a lot of canned foods uh, and a lot of processed foods to make things cheap and to last a long time. That's what we need in war times. So these are talking about Navy, Navy uh, uh, folks in the Navy being fed this you know, because it's easy to make cheap. That's also when sliced bread came about. Sliced bread, you know, what was was uh, probably the early 1900s, but you, you got sliced bread, you got cheap cheese from Velveeta. Uh, Kraft made that. Uh, servicemen brought the recipe back to their families after the war, and it became something nostalgic. In the 40s and 50s, these were usually served open face, like a cheese toast, and consisted of one slice of bread topped with grated cheese. In 1950, Kraft food introduced Kraft singles, individually wrapped, slices of processed cheese and the supermarket started stocking them in 65 and it just it became a very nostalgic taste okay also around that time the second most perhaps important piece uh, of bread was added to the top likely as a way to make the sandwich more filling and the modern notion of a grilled cheese was born Whew, awesome so i just ran just a little bit over thank you all for your time uh like i said our next i'll be sending out uh, several more dates uh, so you can have a little bit more time to prepare to come to these. I will post this on the Institute du Fromage YouTube channel for review. In our next class, we will be discussing pathogens and European cheese. Uh, I thank you all so much, and I hope you all have a very wonderful day and uh, have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you.